Welcome to Founders Uncut, the podcast that goes beyond the romanticized founder journey to discover the moments of vulnerability and doubt that even the most successful founders face. I'm Maria Palma, general partner at Kindred Capital. Here with me today is Mike Quinn, the founder of Zona, one of Africa's startup darlings for a period of time. He and his co-founders built Zona, a money transfer and remittance business, to over 3,000 agents and processing more than 2.5 billion of transactions. They were live across two African markets, Zambia and Malawi. They earned 86 million in revenue over the period that they ran the company. And Mike was one of the first founders on the continent to raise venture. They raised through Series B, but ultimately their Series C and the future growth of the company went into a death spiral. Mike has reflected on the journey and written a book called Failing to Win, and he is now on to his next venture, Boost Technology. The startup journey is never the easy, straightforward path it appears to be from the outside. So let's dig a little deeper and uncover the real story on Founders Uncut. In 2016, Zona had just raised a $15 million Series B and hired an external executive to come in and open up Mozambique. Just a few months later, things were not going to plan, and Mike had to make one of the toughest decisions he has ever made. At this point, I think uh, Zona was uh, already a wild success. So we had um, you know, over a million active customers in our, in our core market, Zambia and Malawi, and we hired our first non-founder executive, um, and we raised our Series B, our, as you mentioned, $15 million on, on the back of this hire and um, his leading an expansion plan into new markets. Um, <clears throat> and we ended up uh, expanding into Mozambique, uh, burning through about $6 million with, with very little like revenue to show from it. And it was just a, a huge failure. Um, what, one of many that I think we experienced at the time. But uh, the realization that I got through in the process is we needed to make a uh, a change, and it was the first like executive person that I ever had to exit, um, and it was just excruciatingly difficult uh, to get to the decision internally, and then the the pressure that I felt um, from like our board, our investors who had backed us with all this money, the, the storytelling around how um, we were just going to expand and like take over the world, um, how we had this great culture and we knew how to hire and. You know, everybody was behind this plan and then it just didn't work. And having to like unwind all of that um, was just an experience that like if I if I put myself back in that place, like the, the stress and the pressure was like almost unbearable. Yeah, I think to your point, as you've been telling everyone, we've, built, we've hired the right team, we've built the right culture. Like, you know, you've out, been out there telling to everyone else and yourself. And now you have to tell yourself that maybe something in there is off. Um, talk us through like, what does that feel like mentally? Like what else was going on in the background while this was happening? And how did you feel when you were making that decision? Yeah. Um, so externally, um, and I, I, I'm sure many people will relate to this um, who are founders, it's like, you know, people see the LinkedIn announcements and the funding round and you hear you're expanding. So everybody is high-fiving you saying like, you know, I heard Zona's killing it and you guys are just taking over and, and doing so well. Um, and internally, like we had a split leadership team, we had siloed cultures, um, people were fighting, were arguing. There was like no alignment, and and everybody was like you know trying their best. Like every like we all respected each other. We were all working hard, so it wasn't like you know um, you're a jerk and and or I'm a jerk. Like it was you know good people, but just totally misaligned, different philosophies, different ways of working, and then the results weren't coming, and so um, none of this was exposed to the outside and even to like our board and investors. So we um, I felt all of the pressure. Um, as the CEO of, of resolving that. And um, and then when I finally got my head around what I needed to do, which was like really to step up and have the courage to say, you know what, I'm going to um, I'm gonna exit this person. Um, and then I had to align my team. And then I had to align my board and investors, many of whom I think um, uh, had like a very legitimate question of like, well, is he the problem or am I the problem? Right. And, and I had some that were almost trying to convince me of that. Um, and, and then when we, uh, when we made the call and I, I set in, in motion like an irreversible path just through like a series of conversations, um, then realizing that like uh, there was another like 30 plus people in the company that he had brought in 
um, that were part of this culture. And we had to go through a three month process afterwards of like an entire changing of the guard really. Um, and it was, uh, a, a great learning experience. Like that's part of the book is like, um, I look back at this failure and I was like, well, the, there were warning signs like during the recruitment, during the onboarding, could have got the to the decision much earlier without as much emotion. We could have handled, um, handled the process a lot better. Um, but eventually we did get there and it was, uh, it was quite a big, um, I think release of like energy once, once we got through it, but it cost us a lot of time and a lot of money. Yeah, there's, I mean, I think there's nothing harder than having like two separate cultures within a team as you're trying to build and grow quickly. When you had those discussions with investors and they're saying, I don't know who's the problem or whatnot, or they're, you, you already have enough self-doubt as it is being a founder, <laughs> then let alone having more people try to place more self-doubt. How do you maintain your own sanity of like seeing clearly in those moments? Sometimes you don't, to be honest. Um, that is the honest truth. Like sometimes you, you sit at home in your room hyperventilating and <laughs> wondering why you're doing this all. Um, but, uh, and I've always found it's like, especially as the CEO, um, like as a founder, it's hard, but as a CEO, like you're in this position where you have, um, probably more information than everybody. Cause you, you see like everything and you have all the com conversations with different like stakeholders at different levels. Um, and everybody's giving you advice and everybody's telling you what you should do or what you should have done. And, um, often there's no right answer. It's like, you know, it, you could be like, well, if I did this, then something else might've happened. Um, and so it is, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of pressure and, um, you know, what, what I found, like, I, I'm a very positive, um, often over-optimistic person. So I think naturally, I think a I, lot of founders are, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and naturally, um, I, I kind of, I'm just like, I persevere and like, and like, I, I think tenacity is like a really important, like kind of virtue, um, to, to have as a founder. Um, but what I've learned as well is to surround myself, um, not with like, you know, critical naysayers or people that are, are saying no, but like people who just have very different perspectives. Mm -hmm. And I, I've had to learn to listen to them a lot more. Um, and so my, my second um, venture that I've started, Boost, as an example, like when I was looking for a co-founder, the first thing I did was I, I kind of made a list of like, here are the things that I'm good at and that I like doing and that bring me energy. And then here are the things that are my blind spots that I, I'm not good at. And then I want to find somebody who can do those things. Um, and then I found uh, an amazing co-founder, Mary, and, and we, we fight, we argue because we see the world totally differently, but we have this, um, this great respect. And it's, and I, I've learned through just, um, my personal growth that like, she keeps me in check. And if I listen to her a lot more, I can almost save myself from myself <laughs> from getting into some of the situations that need to then be undone later on. Yeah. I think that's incredible advice for anyone. Um, Going back to one second, you mentioned the hyperventilating in your room alone. I think there was a story about, you know, you being at something where Bono was there. You know, the, <laughs> tell us the backdrop. But like, what is, how do you get through those moments, right? Because at some point, once enough of them have built up, you just like, it's very taxing personally. Yeah. Like, how do you make it through that? Yeah, so so this goes back to the um, to the executive exit, this this particular story, because um, I, I was actually at the, the School World Forum um, for Social Entrepreneurship in Oxford when this was all going down and, and realizing... Um, that like we, we were going to exit this person. I, I actually wrote a, wrote a letter and, and sent it. Um, so it kind of, you know, put it in writing. And then it was, I knew once I hit send on that, um, on that email, I'm like, there's no going back from this. And then uh, Bono shows up at the School World Forum and does a performance. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm kind of sitting there in the audience and I like, I can't hear the music. Um, I'm, I, I'm getting pings on Slack from people saying, what did you just do? And and I, I actually, um, everybody went out afterwards and I went back into my, into my room and I'm just like, you know, I, I just couldn't handle it anymore. Um, and, uh, but then I, you know, I woke up and I, I, you know, lived to fight another day. Um, and I, I found it was really helpful to, to kind of talk about it. So I, I had like a good support network. Um, my, my wife was amazing along the journey. Like she, she bore the brunt of like a lot of the, the highs and like all the mm -hmm. highs and the lows and especially the lows. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and it took me a while to realize this, but like you, you, you know, as a founder, you don't go through anything by yourself. Right. And I think when you put it all on yourself, um, that's when it's the hardest, mm -hmm. but then when you actually open up and you, you find like mentors or coaches or peers and you, you share more openly, which is part of what I wanted to do actually writing this book after I left, um, it makes you feel a lot better, but then you realize like we all have these shared experiences yeah. and, and, we're all failing like all the time. 
And most of the time we're actually like faking it till we make it, right? Um, and so, um, but that, that's the journey of like, I think, personal growth. And um, I, I've, I've learned to, um, you know, to be a lot less emotional and just to like enjoy it more. And, and you know, when, when there's something that I fail at now, I can, I can actually put my hand up and say, oh, that didn't work. That was a total failure. But I, I feel much less like, hey, I'm a failure and I, I need to go into this like dark place of self-doubt and, yeah. and wondering like how I screwed it all up. And so that's something I've, I've learned. Yeah, I think that's um, it's really hard to delineate those two sometimes, right? But it's the truth is we're all feeling all the time as yeah. humans. And to your point, that is just the progress. Um, I mean, I think if people read the book, they'll see there's so many moments where you had such a hard journey and then you found a solution, right? Like whether it was cholera outbreaks or getting taken on by the biggest well-funded com- com- like companies in the country, like so many things. And so I think the story is incredible. So without going into like, I guess, all the detail of the story, as you think back and reflected and wrote the book and looked back on what had happened with the journey, what are some of the key lessons that you learned and some of the things that you obviously signed up to do it again with yeah. new companies? So, um, but I think how, you know, what did you learn and what are you going to do differently in this company? Yeah. So I'll, I'll maybe share two. So one is um, kind of what we're talking about around, um, uh, when I left, I, I, like when you fail, it hurts, right? And you, like, there's a human emotion. Like if, if anything fails, like you, you personalize it and it hurts. And especially when you're a leader, you're like, I'm accountable for this and I need to own this. Um, but but I, what I really um, have figured out uh, and reflected on is like we like you said we were failing all the time in order to win. So not only did we fail to kind of win in the end where we didn't get like the big kind of unicorn exit that you know was was the hope and the plan. Um, it is the process of innovation and like the startup journey of you fail you fail you fail you fail you fail and then you have a breakthrough um, and then the breakthrough gets like the press statement or the LinkedIn post or something like that. But it's those are often are, are few and far between, and there's like a whole process of failure to get to that point, um, which which led me to like my new company because it was sitting back and saying, well, what are like the biggest failures that we had at Zona? Um, what did I actually learn from those, and how could I apply those, you know, to set up something new, and and use this like penultimate failure at Zona to then set up something that could you know go on and, and hopefully be a big success and have a ton of impact, um, and be a lot of fun too. So like in, like I. I try to enjoy the journey and, and not get so obsessed on the outcome anymore. Um, one, of, one of the, the, the biggest learnings I've had um, that I've, I've also done differently is to really focus on um, building a team with the, what I would call like the fewest right people. Um, and, and this is like, it's actually really hard to do this because especially when you're, you're venture funded, like you get, the, you, you get the money by selling the story. And then once you have the money, you're like, well, I've got the money, I've got to grow and I've got to spend it. And then you spend it by hiring a whole bunch of people and building big teams. Um, but then that that's where you can lose control very quickly because you might not hire the right people. The culture starts diluting or, or, or evolving into ways that you might, might not have envisioned at the beginning. And so um, I really wanted to build a, a new company where it's like, well, how do we do this with the fewest number of people so that we can move fast, we can stay more aligned? Mm-hmm. Um, we can be really like deliberate of who we bring on. Um, and, and then, you know, when, when you have that crisis that is inevitable in a startup, you're like, oh, well, I, I don't have to, you know, restructure 30 people. I've got to like, you know, there's like a couple of people that may need to go or there's like you can you have a lot more flexibility if you don't have just like huge fixed costs. Um, you can move a lot faster and adapt. Um, but then if they're, um, you know, also making sure your team is is the right team. So people fit the culture um, of the company, um, they, f- they have the skills and experience for the role, they're, they're, they fit the stage of the business. Um, and being like just super deliberate about designing like team and culture. Yeah, right? you said something in the book that I thought was great because you're like, at first we didn't think we had time to build culture, but then culture exists whether you care about it yeah. or not. So how do you think about being deliberate and intentional about that culture? Yeah, um, such a great question because it's exactly what happened. And I, I think most founders go through this journey where they, they don't think about the culture until it's too late. Um, and then ultimately they have like a big restructuring and have to like turn over a lot of the staff and then redesign. Um, so with, with Boost, um, it was the first thing I did, um, which I, I took the, uh, at the end of failing to win, um, I've got a set of uh, five like guiding, um, guiding virtues um, and then like uh, 20 principles of like team principles and business principles. and. That was like really the, the learnings from, from going through this process and writing the book. 
And then I, I sat down and flushed those out um, with my, uh, then I had two co-founders at, at Boost. Um, and then we, we set up an, another team and we kind of went through an exercise together and said, well, how do we bring these to life and like actually design the culture for Boost like based on, on these virtues and principles um, from failing to win? Um, and it was the first thing we did before we even like thought about like product market fit or mm -hmm. value proposition. Um, and now, um, you know, we're 18 months into the, into the journey and we're realizing like how important that foundational work was, but also we've like made lots of mistakes and, and, um, over and over we're like, oh, you know, we could have seen this coming because we had actually written this down and, and, but we're, we're getting a lot better at, um, at course correcting and, and spotting, you know, where, where somebody's not a fit initially, or you have a behavior that's misaligned with, with the yeah, goal. Yeah, I think when you've defined it, right, then yeah. you can see what fits or not. I actually earlier this week facilitated a value session for a company, and I find that a lot of time people do the work of getting together and setting a few words, but they don't do the next step of like, what does that actually mean? If exactly. we say we want high integrity, we say we want fun, transparency, like what does that mean? How do we see it in the culture? What does it look like when it's there, when it's not there? How do we actually like operationalize that and and call it out when we see it or don't see it. Yeah. And and I think it's it's much more than like values. Um, because like values are important. And I I, you know, I I like to to go with virtues because they're more action oriented like um values. And uh but like it's it's really getting into like your your kind of guiding principles and the behaviors. Right. It's that's, totally that's the behaviors, right? right? Yeah. It's like values are not what you put on the wall or you say yeah. that it's the behaviors. Like how do people treat each other, how you make decisions, what you do, that's what it is. Um speaking of culture, there's one thing I wanted to read from your book. It was a specific expert excerpt that I thought was great because when you're growing as a startup, we've all seen this, right? You're like go going from office to office, you keep getting bigger and bigger, and there's like all this energy and growth. And then on the other side of that journey, you talk about like where basically you had to let people go, and then the office that had a lot of room for people, you have people working at tables for eight as one, and there's like plants everywhere, and you, you described it like this. You said, the historic Cape Town building we had once envisioned as the headquarters for hundreds of Zona employees was now a somber, cavernous place. Its silence stood in stark contrast to the colorful signs and inspirational quotes that proclaim the culture and values in every corner. And I thought this was just so well written and just really painted the picture. And how do you how do you manage culture and morale when everything's not up and to the right and there's a lot of uncertainty and it's and it's spiraling the wrong direction you don't want it to go? It, it's um, so hard. It's it's a it's a great question. I and I don't know if I have the right answer for that actually because um, I, I remember the the moments and the discussions we had at the time where it's like how much do we share with people about like the reality and like the the dire situation we're in because we're like if we if we get everybody together, um, then you know half the people may leave, and and the and often the the people that you you don't necessarily want to leave, like your key, you know your key engineers that um, recruiters are hitting them all the time. If they feel like the company is like not not going well, they're the first ones to go, and then it kind of accentuates the death spiral that that we were in because the market had actually shifted at the time. Um, what I. You know what I think we figured out how to to manage was like to to get the a balance where the the key people and the key leadership we were as honest as we possibly could because mm -hmm. and I think when you you do rally the staff of like this is the situation and and we're in and um, and then th the people that you really want will lean in mm -hmm. to it um, if they feel that they're part of that um, and. Uh, but like sometimes also like th this was the end of, of my Zona story. Like sometimes you actually do need to to call it or you need a leadership change. Mm -hmm. Right. And so um, when I finally got to the realization that I'm like, you know, there's nothing I as the CEO and the, like one of the co-founders could do because um, the economics of the business had changed. We had too much um, sunk equity from investors. The, the market had shifted. We'd lost our, our position to competitors. And um, I'm like the, the dream is not going to like our vision is not going to be achieved in this vehicle and it is time for me to leave. Mm -hmm. Right. And, um, I, I can't just keep motivating people and saying, it's all going to be okay. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Cause it, it's, it wasn't at that mm -hmm. time. Um, so it, it's, I don't think there's a right answer or to yeah. your question. It's just like a super hard challenge and finding that balance between being honest and continuing to like motivate people to go on, um, without oversharing to demotivate mm -hmm. them. Um, yeah, but that's also, a hard balance to get yeah. right. You know, there's no, I'm sure there's, there is no It's very, very, very situational, I yeah. think. One of the things that we both share a passion for is kind of governance and thinking about boards in a different way. I think there's a lot of, unfortunately, there's a lot of highly unfunctional boards. 
And a lot of founders that I've seen um, don't really think about how to manage the board. And I think the board almost of itself is a team that you should think about the culture, how they work together, how to how to make decisions and go through stressful situations together. Um, and even I, for a lot of founders, I just think there's such a drag coefficient of the board. They spend all this time creating these huge updates instead of actually having a generative discussion about what action needs to happen in the business. Like, can you give us some lessons from your journey on the ways you think you should work with investors or manage the board? Yeah. Um, so the, the first lesson I would say is uh, just like what I mentioned with team and culture of like the fewest right people. I, I that, that, think that applies directly to a board. Um, uh, like who, constructing and designing the board from the beginning of, first of all, um, keep it as small as possible. Um, like don't even have one until you need one. You can have advisory boards, you can have advisors, like people that you call on for certain information, but formal governance can actually um, be quite a drag on a, on a very early stage company. Uh, eventually, if you're, especially if you're venture backed, you will have a board. So then it's around having um, the, the people on the board knowing they're going to have influence and control. So ensuring you have the right people, you, you define roles. Um, and this is the job also of the CEO. Like suddenly now um, you have your, your executive team that you're, you're leading, but you also have your board that you're leading and you need to put um, a lot of thought into how you, you manage them. Um, and then like s practical things that I did was uh, that worked really well um, was shifting away from just updates and reporting upwards, which are important to keep people aligned. Um, but actually investing a lot in relationship building. Mm -hmm. um, so having like we would have dinners before every board meeting and I, like learned if, if the dinner was after the board meeting, the board meeting was generally crap. If the dinner was before, you kind of catch everybody up. People are are more relaxed. And then you go into the meeting and everybody's like more positive and you, you're, you've already covered like everybody like showing up saying what's happening in the business. Yeah. Right. Um, and then just framing it um, where as the CEO, you, you talk uh, – a lot less than like, um, so how I would structure our, our meetings um, when they were working well is I, you know, I would give a quick update um, at the beginning and say like everybody should have read the materials in the board pack um, so we know where the business is at, but this, this meeting is now a discussion, right? So here, here are like, you know, one or two or three like big questions and um, trying to use the board uh, to absorb information and feedback from them to help in like the decision making and, and, and strategy um, rather than approaching the situation where like, okay, I'm just reporting and I'm doing all of the talking. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a transition that we, you know, we spent a lot of time getting through, but by, by the end of the Zona journey, we had an amazing board and it was quite functional. Yeah. Um, lots of ups and downs and, and some challenges along the way, but it's yeah. possible if you, if you design it right. That's great. Um, I think that's really good advice for any founder. Um, speaking of all these ups and downs, you mentioned before your wife and you have two kids that I think came along during the Zona journey. So how do you think about managing relationships and having any sanity for life outside of the startup when you're in such an intense environment? Yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, my, my wife uh, uh, is amazing. I should just say that uh, outright. And, and she, um, she went through all the ups and downs, as, as I mentioned before, with me. So, I, you know, I think having that support um, and, and realizing, like, you're not alone and, and you know, she knew from the beginning when she married me, like I was an entrepreneur and she was kind of part of this journey. Um, so she signed up for it, but probably didn't like none of us know yeah. or what we were actually signing up for. Um, what about being a dad, though, right? Kids, kids aren't yeah. really giving you that support so, no, but right no, away. <laughs> yeah, but um, I actually feel like having kids made me a, a way better leader because it, it forced me to slow down and to take time off, take my weekends back. Because before I was just like, I still like I'm a workaholic. I still work a lot. But it's like when you have little kids that are like crawling around your ankles, like you, you can't like you have to put down the phone, right? You you need to take breaks. And often um, as a leader and like a founder, like the problem is you're like working too much and you, you don't make good decisions and, and you're not actually thinking clearly. Um, and so I, I found like having a family like allowed me to to do that. Um, and this is actually one of my pet peeves and all these like. Uh, t Twitter threads and, and blogs, you know, where it's like all the people like wake up at five in the morning and they, you know, do this, this and this, this, you know, as to be super productive, like few of them are saying like, I wake up and I, you know, I make my wife a coffee and or my you know husband a coffee and I, I walk my kids to school. And then, um, but I, I've, I've learned that um, when I do those things, I'm happier, my mm -hmm. family's happier. Um, I make better decisions. Um, and so I, I do think it's possible. 
Um, and it's probably because, you know, I'm, I'm 41 now. So it's like I'm in a different phase of life. I'm, I'm not like, uh, you know, 25 year old anymore. That's just like free to do yeah. whatever I want. But by the um, way, I feel like when I read those, I feel like half of those are fake anyway. I'm like, that's not or yeah. like, Or I'm like, where are you working? They're like, I have an avocado toast. And then I bike for two hours. And I'm like, what's happening here? Yeah. Um, but no, I think that's actually really good advice. And you're, you're so right. You can't. Uh, I have a one and a half year old and he keeps me honest. If I'm on the phone too much, she's like, mama just yells at me. Um, so I don't do that. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. I think we're out of time, but thank you so much for being with us today. This was incredible. All right. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Mike, for being with us today and sharing the ups and downs of your journey. To see more, check out Mike's book, Failing to Win, on Amazon or Audible. The links are below. To see more episodes like this, go to kindredcapital.vc forward slash founders uncut. And as always, if you're a founder and the journey is hard, you're not alone and you're not doing anything wrong. Being a founder is just hard. Even the most successful founders face fear, doubt, and unbelievable difficulties that never make the headlines. Thanks for being with us here today. And if Mike's story resonated with you, join us again on Founders Uncut.